Hey folks, John Hazel here. This is the interview. I've got a special guest, George Cook. George, thanks for coming today. You betcha, John Bond. Awesome to be on the water with you. It's been a little while. It's sunny. It's sunny. It's sunny. So, bright spots, uh, we've got a new line of rods out, the X-Series from Sage, which you've got one right there. Right here. We're at the Spayclave this last weekend, and uh, we, we, well, I cast a bunch of them, which is just awesome, and, and we had to put them in people's hands, send them down to the water. What can you tell us about the new X-Series? Well, the X, as you know, replaced the, the vaunted one family of rods, both single-hander, spay and switch. The, um, the new X-Series, which means 10, yep. represents the 10th major rod family in the course of time from Sage, hence the name. Um, and it takes the kinetic storyline that was found in the ones, which um, produces tremendous line speed, accuracy, uh, takes care of uh, torsional distortion or what I like to call east-west wobble. Mm -hmm. So that when you're casting, everything stays north and south, resulting in loop integrity of the highest level, accuracy and blistering, blistering line speed. And so yeah. these, kinetic HD, HD as in high density, these rods take it to the next level, uh, expanding upon that kinetic story in the next fashion of lighter rods that are, well, you, you will see directional acuity at its highest level, sir. Directional acuity is a Georgism that, did that come about during, when, when we had the Sage 1s, so that's, it's, not, it's not new to the X. I've heard that from you for a couple of years. Yeah, it's the right? first time I said it was with, I think, in 8136 or 7136 one. And, uh, well, both these tools right here in my lap represent the ultimate in directional acuity, meaning wherever you point it, it's going, and it's getting there fast, whether it's the Bowtech Prodigy or this 7140X two-handed spay rod, a.k.a. the rocket. That thing is a rocket. I had a chance to cast that uh, this last weekend at the Clave, and, oh, that was fun. That was fun. Uh, Sage hasn't had a 14 foot seven weight since the European 7141, is that correct? We have not had a 14 foot seven. We've had a 14 foot eight uh, at one juncture. And of course, we've always had 14 foot nines as you know, it's a very common rod in Europe and in the King Salmon Theater, British Columbia, yeah. Alaska. But you know, in the seven, the, the, the key seven weights along with eights in the new X, we've got a 7120. 8120, 7130, 8130, and these new guys, 7140 and 8140. I think the 7140 is going to be a star of the summer in the fall fisheries, and that 8140 is going to certainly find its way to British Columbia come this fall in the winter steelhead streams of both the Oregon and Washington coast come winter. No doubt, no doubt. And these rods are so light that you don't know you have a 14 foot rod in your hands. No, you not only don't know that you've got a 14-foot rod in your hands, but really one of the calling cards of these X rods is that they're, each one is respectively shorter. You know, this is 14 versus 15. Mm -hmm. The 13 is 13 versus 13 and a half. Yep. And of course, the 12 is a little shorter than what you've seen in the past in 12 and a half. And these rods have got the octane to perform at a level as high, frankly, higher than their six to 12 inch longer counterparts that you've seen in other families, be it the one, the method, um, the TCX before it, you know, including the, the beloved Death Star. I still take my Death Star on every river trip because it's like, you know, I know you love sports and football analogies. And so I was a couple months ago, it's hard for me not to pick up the Death Star and I have the 12 foot 7x. I have the 7120 and I'm trying to get it into the lineup and every time I cast it I'm just like oh my gosh this thing is incredible but I go back to the Death Star because I know the Death Star so well and I was thinking about it and it's like the Death Star is Favre 
and the 7120 is Aaron Rodgers. And and Favre needs to retire. Well, they both played for Green Bay, and there's green colors in there, and there's green in here, so we're good. Well, that's true. TCX is green. <laughs> well, there's no doubt. I mean, you go back, I mean, once a year, generally king fishing in Alaska, the, the old Death Star makes the trip. Yeah. Makes the trip. It's in yeah. the traveling squad. And as awesome as that rod is, and certainly at, at its peak, yeah. Uh, was one of the most popular, possibly the most popular Sage two hander of all time. Yeah. These rods, the this X series is dramatically lighter in hand. Yeah. More responsive. The kinetic story drives uh, loop integrity at the highest level, and the line speed is a reflection of that that comes off these, regardless of length or line weight. Well, I've definitely put it to the test so far. Um, with everything I've asked the the X to do, that that I know the Death Star can do, the X does it lighter, better, and just as easy. Whether I'm regardless of the line, sink tip, and fly, I'm trying to, to deliver, the X does it. And with these shorter lengths and lighter rods, the fatigue factor uh, is virtually non-existent. Even with these 14 footers, yeah. I mean these rods feel like. 13 and a half foot rods of yesteryear, possibly even 13s, yeah. uh, 13 and a half. Yeah. So a reduction of fatigue, greater performance, responsiveness, and again, ferocious line speed. Ferocious line speed. So, you know, we both love sports. You use a lot of sports analogies. Uh, you do presentations about being the spay quarterback knowing when to audible. Um, when did you start using these analogies? Or you, have you always? Well, it's always fun to draw similarities to things that people can recognize, relate to, maybe even laugh at, because if they laugh at it, pretty good odds are gonna remember it. Um, the the spade quarterback thing, I mean, you, you yourself were a college quarterback, so you know, when you get out here, you notice, well, I think we got a downstream wind currently at, at the back of my neck. Yep. And, you know, when a, when a spay caster, whether he's a fish and steelhead, uh, king, sea run dolly, sea run browns, and Terra del Fuego, when he walks out onto that bank and into that river, his, his sense of his environment has to go to a very cute level, far more so than with a single hander. By no means am I dismissing, you know, paying attention sure. with a single hander, but your, your level or your need to pay attention goes up threefold with these things. Uh, wind direction in terms of what cast will you choose, water speed, the water height that you're choosing to wade in. All these things go into spay casting that makes you really think. Yeah. And you and I, John, are both archery hunters, and so we pay innate attention to the wind in terms of what it's doing, is it changing, and as a spade caster, it's a natural uh, transition to paying attention to that wind because if you don't, you're going to find that uh, you're going to be wearing the fly. No doubt. You're going to be wearing it. It's been a while since I hit myself with my fly, but I remember hitting myself in the face. It was not a good feeling. Well, if you haven't taken your hat off, you ain't been out here enough. That's right, <laughs> no doubt, Yeah. no doubt. So, you know, as the spay quarterback and knowing when to audible, you know, you talk, you hear rookie quarterbacks, they often, with few exceptions, they don't do well their first season, but they talk about how the game slows down. Um, what are some things that spay casters can do to help the game slow down so they can get to the line of scrimmage. They know what what play to call, what to audible. And what the defense is doing. And the what defense, that? in in this environment, uh, the defense is the wind, the water, the height of the water, the speed. And I think when you come out, you just simply have to take note. You know, what's wind doing? Is there wind? If so, what direction? How deep am I wading? And generally, as as we all know, Wading 
less deep, less equals more because if you've got a height advantage above the water with these rods, uh, your ability to put forth a clean cast is enhanced. Yeah. And heck, that's why you buy these things. No so doubt. you don't have to wade out there. I think in Gaz's book, Gosworth's book, uh, he says every 10 or every foot you wade deeper, you lose 10 feet of distance. I think as that's a, as incredibly a general, accurate. As and a general rule. It also changes the height of your stop when you come into the D loop. That, that all changes pursuant to what depth you know, you've waded out to. So really, ideally, an angler, if he can be in that ankle to knee deep water, that's preferable. Now, obviously, a nice bar like this would afford that, but there's going to be places, you know, think the Umqua, where you're going to step off and, and you're already into this by virtue of the nature of that piece of water. But again, you know, you're, you're coming around into a D loop will change in terms of where you stop in terms of sometimes even, you know, if you've got a big willow bank, again, think the Umqua, sometimes your D loop is not in back of you, but even with you, even a forward established D loop with a very short line where you've choked up on things. But all of these things go into the, the fact that you, when this rod goes in your hand and you step in this ditch, you, have, you will become a spay quarterback. You will become a master of paying attention to your surroundings, yeah. be it water, wind, what have you. And maybe compared to a, a trout fisherman, uh, you know, you walk in, you, you observe, you see what bugs are hatching, and then you adapt based on what you observe for the steelhead fisherman. Uh, things you mentioned, wind, water depth, so on and so forth. And then obviously the reading water part factors in. Well, Oregon is a, a magical place for the anadromous fisher for steelhead because you've got, you know, here we are on the rogue this beautiful day in May. You know, come summer, fish are going to be in here. Fish are going to be in the northern California streams. They're going to be in the Umpqua. Soon the Deschutes and then it kind of goes from there. And yeah. all these fisheries are different. I mean, yeah. this river is, is very classical runs. These are, are classic steelhead runs. Just beautiful, beautiful water on this river. I mean, I have fished with you in numerous times down here and it's always been at, at the very least interesting and sometimes absolutely off the hook great. But you go to the Umpqua, and that tends to be a river of slots. And, yeah. and so yeah. everything's different. And, you know, when you step in, particularly if you go on a guided trip, you know, with you here or, you know, a Rich Zellman up there on the Umpqua or, or old Tony or Jeff Carr up there, boy, when those boys are talking, listen, because mm -hmm. they know where these things live. They, yeah. they absolutely do. And you'll learn a lot. And you'll learn a lot about Broad Run here with a guy like you or fishing with old Dax. And up there, you're gonna learn about where they, these fish are in slots or they're in tail outs. And it's all different, but that's what makes it so exciting. One of my favorite George quotes, uh, I don't remember what magazine it was, but a number of Northwest guys were interviewed and the question was, when you're swinging, do you hold the loop or is your line tight to the reel? And your answer was, tight to the reel because when the phone rings I want to answer it I don't want call waiting yeah when you get grabbed and I know it's so situational um, you know setting not setting loop no loop you fish for anadromous fish all over the planet um, it's got to become instinct at some point but for the for the beginner is there advice you can give that guy do what's comfortable. Number one, do what's comfortable. Number two, and maybe more important, maybe this should be number one, is do what makes you feel confident because anytime you step in, I don't care what you're doing, you know, dry fly fishing with a seven foot nine three weight or lake fishing with a nine and a half foot six weight or one of these big sticks out here on the big ditch. Do what makes you confident because if you're confident, your head's in the game. And your head needs to be in a game. You need to be thinking that, hey, I'm out here. I'm enjoying it. I'm relaxed. Uh, I'm doing things in sequence. 
I feel good about it. I got no bad vibes because bad vibe. They know about the bad vibes. They know it. They know it. They and feel it. You you hear old timers say that, and you go, ah, oh, that's hogwash. No, I think it's very true. I mean, you you don't need any bad vibes coming down this 14 foot graphite out there. If you're confident, your head will be in the game. And when a fish takes, you know, for the most part, let them chew the gum. Let them chew. Mm -hmm. You know, that first grab with, with a swung fly is certainly no time to be bringing it. You know, we, we like to let them. And when that rod starts to act like it's going to fix and to be taken away from you, that's, that's time to bring it. But not on that first bump. You know, a lot of times these fish, they follow, they grab, they mouth it, they drop it, they mouth it, they drop it they grab it, they turn. So when you get those, those grab, drop, grab, drop, that's what the, they're grabbing it and dropping it. Or they're mouthing it and it's in there, but they haven't turned and you need them to turn to get that hook set. So the, m my advice there to anybody, let them chew the gum. A little gum chewing is good. A little gum chewing is good. Well, we're gonna keep chewing the gum here when we return from this short break. More with George Cook. Before the Red Seas were parted, he sold Moses a sage switch rod because they're so versatile. He once fished an Orvis rod just to see what it was like. He has a 10 banana minimum just to level the playing field. When the fish jumps, the fish bows to him. His sink rate is measured in fish per second. He is the most mega man in the world. I'm not always mega. Yeah, naturally I am. Stay mega, my friends. Welcome back. I'm here with George Cook. We've got a lot of graphite, carbon fiber here, George. What's uh, what's a bow for? Well, you told me that this spot, specifically right here, was chock full of bears. Oh, yeah. So I thought, well, we need to be safe. Yeah, there's a lot of bears down here. Lots yeah. Of, lots of food for oh, boo -boo. Eat. and uh, There's old berry patch over there. Berry patch and pears and swampy back channel riparian wet areas. Yeah, dead kings. It's dead a bear kings. buffet. It's a bear buffet it's here. It's a bear buffet down yeah, there. Just, yeah, I wanted to, you know, we brought the bow along. We, we've been filming a few things and keeping our eye out for trespassers. So, George, it's no, <laughs> yeah, trespassers beware. It's no secret uh, how much you love to hunt. You and I have that in common. And yes, sir. If I hunted as much as you did, uh, well. well you currently I, got a little one at home, so you're kind of. I got a little one yeah. at home. You're on a limited leash. I'm on a limited leash. <laughs> You've already gone down that yeah. road. I'm on a financial leash. <laughs> you're on a limited right. leash. That's right. That's right. So I've always thought of, of trout or more like deer you know they're, they kind of stay where they stay they're more resident they they it, it's somewhat migratory but for the most part they live where they live and when you hunt them you're in their zone and you got to really figure them out and i've all thought of of elk are more like steelhead they're migratory and moody and they cover a lot of ground and you got to find them elk are where they're at when you think of other fish versus a critters you hunt. Like who, you know. Who's who? Who's who? Well, you know I love to fish kings. I spend a couple of weeks a year up in Alaska fishing kings, strictly on spay. Although I cut my teeth fishing with single handers. Yep. And big sink tips in the old days, kind of OG stuff. Three, four, 500 grain lines uh, out of boats, which is still a great way to get them. But the spay rod, has made the king game a lot more interesting and 
Kings, what critter are they? Oh, African kudu. African you know, kudu. Yeah, it's a big deal. You know, we're looking for a 50 pound king. That's, that's similar to looking for a 50 inch kudu. And uh, I've been fortunate to, to have encounters with both. And, you know, but when you talk about elk and compare them to steelhead, that's a good one because elk, like steelhead, are a fish of, you know, we're, we're going to put in a lot of effort and we're going to hope for opportunity, although I shouldn't say hope because you know my favorite saying about hope, don't you? Hope is not a strategy, John Bond. Yep. yep. But you're, you're working. You're working for you're working. opportunity. Yep. And, you know, one thing that steelheaders... Much like elk, you know, if you and I get on the trailhead and go up in and we're going to ease on into where we're going and we're not going to go in there bugling like it's the 7th Calvary. I mean, we're going to go in, we're going to ease on in. And, you know, if, I, if you and I were on this run first thing in the morning, I know you would tell me, hey, listen, don't get past your ankles on those first few casts and really have very little line out because those fish will naturally be in this easy living water in low light of morning and evening and so don't rush in you know i think yeah. that describes both steelhead and elk yeah particularly archery elk yeah uh, perfectly john you know? yeah trout you know much like deer up uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunity i mean you know you blow a cast on a trout you're probably going to get another one you see a deer he, he walks off he wins you yeah we'll probably see some more elk no mistakes no not have any mistakes. Yeah, because next thing you know, they're 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 four miles away. Yeah, when they leave and they ain't four hundred yards, it's four miles. Yeah. Yep. And we got you know uh, got me thinking. At first light, yeah, they might be out and about doing their thing, but when they go to bed down, that's a different game. And so, a steelhead when the sun's out like it is now, it's it's bedded down and it's hiding. Yeah, if it's he's hiding. got any wood to go get in, he's gonna go get in the wood. And um, yeah, that's what makes morning and evening so prime, you know, and whether it's steelhead, sea run browns, all, all those critters are, you know, early and late is, that's no different than deer or elk, you know, early, late, you know, live by it, be, make sure you're in on it. Is there a, a Sasquatch in the conversation? We're in Oregon, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, well, we're a little ways from the McKenzie, but we could see one. We could. You is know, it's, yeah, go ahead. Is there a Sasquatch fish? Hmm. Golden bone fish? <laughs> you hear people talking about that? <laughs> is there a golden I'll tell you, if fish? I, you know, we may run into a Sasquatch. If we do, I got one word for you. If I see him. What's that? Smithsonian. <laughs> <laughs> He's on a one way trip to the Smithsonian. <laughs> Be on, be on late night TV. Oprah even have a song for that one. <laughs> we are in Squatch Country, no doubt, no doubt. So, you know, we've got these arrows here, and and uh, we've got a bow, and we've got we've got a graphite rod. What else are we missing? Is that Bucky? I mean, I told him not to come to this. He wasn't invited. He's a, he's a 10 point, actually he's not. He's a management eight, he's got no eye guards. That's management buck. And he's trespassing on this interview. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> we ain't standing for this. This ain't going on on our watch. Range him, 20-ish. 19 from where I'm sitting. Well, 20 from my seat, Ace. Hold this. It was a lucky arrow. We got good wind too. We got good wind. We're in the right spot. You know what? We we can't have this aberrant behavior here. What'd you say? Nineteen. Nineteen. It's twenty from here. I think that thing is dealt with. Nice shot, George. Yeah? We'll give him a half hour. Give him a half hour. We'll be done with the interview by then. 
<laughs> so that arrow went on a straight line. That, my friend, was directional acuity. Bowtech prodigy. Just like the X rod, there's, there's no east west wobble. You point and shoot, it's going there and fast. Ferocious line speed, ferocious arrow speed. That's what we want. That's what we want. Huh? You got it. He's dead. Bucky's done. We don't need a blood trail. No, heck, he ain't gonna make it 30 yards. <laughs> he's, he's a goner. He's a goner. Well, we got that done. What's next? Mega. Mega? When, you know, there's a lot of words I think of when I think of George Cook, but Mega is the one. And Mega has become a, not just a word, but a, a culture. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Where did that come from and what does it take to be Mega? Well, just give it your best and all every day and make everything Mega. I mean, Dax's got that little dog, but he, he's little, but he might be Mega. <laughs> I mean, if he's little. You don't have to be big. No, you don't have to be big. You know, you don't have to be like my 20 some pound cat to be Mega. The old panther. The panther. You met the panther. I've met the panther. Yeah, he's the largest cat in captivity. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mega. I didn't come up with Mega. I may have popularized it, but some, some boys I used to run with up in Washington, a couple of guys, Jay Robeson, Jeff Edvalls, they were the first guys I ever heard really say it. Okay. But then me and me and you got onto it, so we've taken it. We we've gone. We got. We took it out of the 206 area code, and we've gone global with it. Oh yeah, it's, right? it's full West Coast in the least. Yeah, it's it's yeah. America. It's America. Make me America mega again. <laughs> huh? I hope that happens. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> what else you got for me? Well, we're sitting here. We got a lot of graphite. We've talked hunting. We're weaponized. We're fully weaponized. We've got the 14 foot seven. Uh, I mean, we've got seven weights from 11 to 14, eight weights, 11 to 14, six weights in the X series, 11, 12, 13. No, just a 12. No, 13, it tops just, out at 12. Yep. And we got a, a really interesting 12 foot nine weight. It's going to be the new king weapon of British Columbia, Alaska, even, even some of the stuff down here on your coast. 12 foot, 9120, dead on with a 650 skedge at max. And these shorter rods on Kings are really, you know, granted, you know, historically we've caught probably more Kings on 9140, 10150. Yeah. Big weapons. Big weapons. And then, you know, as the 8129Z axis came on board, and you know, some of these shorter rods have proved to be really effective. Yeah. For one thing, they'll cast. They will cast 85 to 90 percent as far as the big weapons. And the nice thing about these shorter ones that are in that 12 to say 13 foot range, when you got Kingy, you know, you're off the bank and you're fighting Kingy from the bank to just out here, you can, you can really lay the wood to him. And when yeah. you're laying the wood with 14 or 15 feet, that gets tough. With these shorter rods, yeah. you can finish them. And, you yeah. know, you need to try to finish them when you've worked so hard to get them there, you know. I see a lot of fish lost in that last 20 feet. Yes, sir. I'm sure you have too. Yeah, and if it becomes a protracted tug of war, then it's just wearing a, it's wearing a hole in them, particularly with them good sharp owner gummy hooks these days. We spent some time at the Spayclave this last weekend with the 9120 and that thing is a weapon it's yep. easy to cast it's light uh and it, it it was super fun to cast and we've got the big ones in the x we got 9140 10 150 i think this 8140 and 8130 are going to have their day in court for yeah. king Ian. E. you know that time's coming up you know bc has a, a, a true spring king run it gets going in may um, Alaska is going to get going Memorial Day on, uh, Bristol Bay, Western Alaska is prime time in June and the front end of July. And so, 
these rods are fixing to have themselves a workout. No doubt. What's your cutoff? Because I kind of think once a sink tip gets to a certain length and weight, the average guy is going to have more of a, it's going to be more of a challenge with the shorter rods to cast heavier, longer sink tips. Is there kind of a cutoff there for you? Well, you know, with these lines today, the, the Skagit Max family, you know, we've got a Max Short, a Max, Max Long. Those lines are all kind of relevant to rod length. So if you take that 91, 20, 12 foot, 9, we're running a Skagit Max 650 on it. Yep. Which that, that line might sound heavy, but it's not. It it's gets not. into the barrel of the bat, which is where we want to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, a caster can throw 10, 11, 12, 13, even 15 feet. I will typically throw a custom cut T14 or T17 in a 13 foot length or even 15 on that rod. Or really, I think 15 tends to be the cutoff on most everything. Mm -hmm. Once the sink tip starts to, I mean, you can make yourself 17s and 20s, but those become arduous to cast, even on big weapons. Yeah. Um, 13 is probably where castability and sink rate meet on the curve. Mm -hmm. 15 is often the fish catcher, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in T14, T17. And I think when a guy is, is fishing those heavy sink tips, uh, you know, if he, if he's playing with 13, if he drops to 11, he probably hits the magic spot of castability. I've seen that over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, we make the Moe's. You guys are super familiar. You sell them every day. Mm -hmm. They're available in 10 and 12 and a half foot sink tips. I'm a big advocate of custom cutting them and making them. Mm -hmm. And I like 9, 11, 13, 15. I think 13 is kind of that magic bullet in mm -hmm. a lot of these sink tips, the custom ones, mm -hmm. where you cut them and make them. Um, 15 is the depth charge, 11 is super castable, mm -hmm. uh, 9 is about as short as you can go before they get a little squirrely. So there's a yeah. cutoff on the short end, I think it's 9, and I think the cutoff on the long is 15. Yeah. 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 So there you are, there's a little get to cutting. Yeah, Spend, you can buy those. You, you've had all winter to make tips, sir. Yep, you can buy it in bulk and do it, or buy a you know a thirty foot chunk and. Yep, and those have got loops on both ends, and yep. that's real easy to make Get a fifteen busy. and a thirteen. And you know, if you want to cut one down, you can cut them down. You know, it's it's like a haircut. It's not. It's hard to put it back on. So, so you start get, long. What's your next king trip, George, or your first king trip? Of the June. Season? June. Nushkak, Western Alaska. Don't ask me where on the nush. I ain't talking. You've somewhere on the nush. Somewhere on the nush, and and uh, you've done well there. Gets a good run of fish. Biggest yeah. run on the planet, sir. Yeah. Reading water for kings versus steelhead. Similar, different. Well, there's two ways Hard to, to say. look at. No, oh, no, no. Two ways to look at kings. A lot of people dread higher water. They go, oh my God, it's high. So, no, we love it. Because high water allows these fish the luxury of being able to come into what I call the pillows, mm -hmm. the nice little edges and soft edges. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is when those fish are on those pillows in the higher water, which is generally associated with the month of June mm -hmm. in Western Alaska, uh, those fish are on, in the water that is typically three to six feet versus say six to 12, yeah. which would be more main channel. Yeah. Main channel's troublesome for the fly rotter yeah. because you simply can't get at those fish. Uh, the sink tips that we all have and employ, none of them get as deep as we'd like to think they do. They simply don't. Yeah. So when those fish are on the pillows, those fish are accessible. And the odds of you showing them the fly are real high in those conditions. So mm -hmm. actually dropping water may, may look better and may on paper be what you think you want, but with the fly, it's really what you don't want. You want mm -hmm. some higher water that's creating those soft edges or those resting spots. It also tends to slow the fish down. Yeah. When they're out there running that mid channel, they're A deep and they're running fast. And that's a bad combo for the spay rod. It just yeah. tends not to get along real well. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and with steelhead too, a lot of people get afraid of high water, but high water is great. A dropping a dropping yeah. ditch yeah. for steelhead is what we all yearn to see, and of course winter provides us with lots of fresh hits and. If you're able to go, you know, whether it's here or the coast or up on the Olympic Peninsula, if you get the call that it's fixing to be a drop and deal and you can go, start the car. Start the car. Start the car. Exactly. Well, George, I hope you get them this year, and I appreciate you coming out today and have, having a talk with us. Look forward to the next one, buddy. Well, we need to wander out and see if Bucky made it past 30 yards. <laughs> okay. I don't think so. Let's go recover that. All right, buddy. buddy. Thanks a lot, George. You got it. Thanks for tuning in to the interview with George Cook.